Digimon, the movie, the blog, part four, the puzzle pieces. Bob and I needed something to grab onto to tie all three parts of the separate movies into one coherent Digimon, the movie. So, we just kept thinking, what do all three parts have in common that we can sort of grasp onto? And there was one item that kept coming up over and over again, a digi-egg, you know. It was the main point of the first movie, and it was a central point of uh, the third movie. So, we just figured, let's uh, use the digi-egg to tie everything together. Um, But, what would that story be? We had no clue. We really pitched each other a ton of ideas, and nothing seemed to make any sense. But we knew we could edit the footage any way we wanted, which was a great advantage to us. We can do anything we wanted with the footage, so we can tell our story through whatever shots we had. We're pretty much re-editing it and scripting that new thing. So, we had the advantage to do that if we could find a good story. And we couldn't. And then finally, one day, we came up with a storyline that made sense logically. So I would, like, throw something out here, and Ink goes, is that satisfy this to move the story into that direction? You know, like a screenplay does. And does it make sense logically? And then we were like, okay, it's a story. It is a complete, coherent story. A a convoluted, coherent story. But it does make sense if you really want to pay attention to it. (laughs) You can hear my enthusiasm. But the biggest thing I hated, I mean, you know, I've written a lot of screenplays at this point. At Digimon the movie, not so many, but still, I had screenwriting experience by the time I got to Digimon the movie. And it went against everything you know about screenwriting to introduce eight new major characters an hour into the movie. It's just ridiculous. So, again, I call a meeting. The director of Digimon (laughs) commands a meeting with the big wigs. No high in this time. He said his piece. So, it's just Terry, Eric, me, and Bob. But Eric and Terry said we need to use all three films. And I said, again, it makes sense, but I don't think we should do it. It's just a mistake. So... Eric and Terry said, well, noted, but you have to use all three films, so let's make it work. End of discussion. And that's it. That was the story. So we started editing, and we pieced together the footage the way we saw it. And when that was done, that's called a locked picture. Picture is locked. This way, all the departments have a copy. And they can work off of that copy. They know nothing's going to change, time code-wise. So you give a copy to sound effects. And you give a copy to music and foley and sound mixer when all that's done and all this good stuff. But most importantly, and firstly, a copy for me and Bob to write to. Because without that, there's nothing there. There's just a bunch of cut clips in all different orders that make, you know, very little sense. So, we have to write a movie... Knowing the spine, it's sort of like working backwards, where when you write a screenplay, you have the spine. There are certain rules that every screenplay sort of follows. And we had to create that with footage, and that's your spine. And then you hang your ideas on that spine, but they're in the order that the rules of screenplay writing happen. So in this case, it was a a little different. We put together the actual images first, And that's our spine. And then we can write any dialogue we want within that to make it all make sense. And uh, it's it's very odd. You know, we we had a a podcast at Spago. The WGA, the Writers Guild of America, threw a party that year for all the writers of theatrically released movies that year. And it was at Spago. And they were doing a live podcast. Now, so this is like 2000, right? The end of 2000, uh, around, uh, it was it was right after the Oscars were announced. And we're hobnobbing with all these people who wrote uh, Pollock and Traffic. I was talking to the guy who eventually 
won the Oscar for uh, Traffic. In fact, I let him go before me because he had just had his fir- his wife had his first kid and was home waiting for him to get home. So uh, I said, yeah, go go ahead of me, sure. And we were interviewed by like uh, uh, a famous Oscar-winning screenwriter who whose name escapes me. I'm sorry. I, I had brain surgery a few years ago and I can't remember everything. Ah, <sighs> boy. I encourage you to use your ailments as an excuse for everything as well, by the way. It gets you out of a lot of uh, tricky little situations. So, what was I saying? Oh, yes. Digimon. The movie. The blog. Part 5. The writing. Writing the dialogue was probably one of the most fun times of my entire life. It was also the most frustrating. (laughs) Uh, Because for every joke you keep, you've thrown away 15, you know, and for every line of dialogue, for that matter. And also, the biggest thing I was just hearing in the back of my head the whole time, like, no matter how funny this script is, no matter how much they applaud our effort of, you know, combining three films into one, this third film's footage is going to kill it. It's just going to kill it. But again, I couldn't complain anymore. I've already complained enough to everyone. So I tried my best to do it, but it was gnawing at me. And I was a very different person back then. I was a very angry person back then. Uh, Speaking of brain tumors, (laughs) the brain tumor sort of woke me up to a bit of what's important in life. And people have noticed that I'm a much different person since the brain tumor. That I am not, and they say this, I'm not angry anymore. So, you know, I can understand that. And back then, I was really angry all the time. (laughs) And I let this decision from the top about using the third film's footage, I, I let it ruin the joy of most of that experience back then, you know? The fun times were when Bob and I nailed a joke And it was like the greatest feeling in the world, you know? Like the Andy Griffith little uh, barbershop scene. We didn't care if anyone got it. If you understood that it was the Andy Griffith show, fantastic. If you didn't, who cares? You know, maybe you'll like it for the first time. It didn't matter to us. We just thought it was funny. But for the most part, I let my own anger ruin that experience for me. And now... I can look back on it from a distance and see it. And I must have been miserable to work with. <laughs> at times, at times I was a lot of fun to work with, you know. But uh, poor Bob, poor Terry, they took the brunt of my, of Hurricane Nimoy coming through town. And uh, I apologize to them now. In front of all of you listening. <sighs> Here's another reason I was miserable. <laughs> Speaking of angry. I was also working a lot. So was Bob. 20 hours a day, six days a week, half a day on Sunday. And uh, all the while, we're working on the movie. We're working on the season, Digimon Season 2. It was just an insane schedule, especially when you're a cranky asshole like I was at the time. Uh, So it, it didn't help, the added stress. And on top of it all... My beloved New York Mets were in the playoffs that year, which was rare. It still is rare. While we were writing, I couldn't watch a game. I I had too much time. So I I had it on once just like uh, during the dinner break and Bob just like threw me out of the office. I couldn't turn it off. He was like, go home and watch the game. And uh, uh, it, it helped me calm down. Uh, just a little more, you know, structure of a real life did calm me down a, li- a, a little bit. Um, the Mets lost that series eventually, but uh, I had much bigger problems. You know, I had this uh, monstrosity of a movie to uh, write. So, Digimon, the movie, the blog, part six, the jokes. First thing was, since uh, Ty wasn't in part three, he couldn't narrate anymore. <sighs> so, Laura Jill Miller, my old friend, Kari, she uh, got more dialogue just from that one decision. So we set about to write the gosh dang funniest anime movie of being released on October 6th. 
We did write a lot of jokes. We wrote so many jokes that we actually couldn't use them all, which is good because a lot of our first choices for jokes were rejected. And that's par for the course in show business. But we did lose some funny stuff. And I do want to share one with you that was particularly funny for me. Uh, Dia Boromon was in New York. And uh, in the movie, Izzy says, he's heading for the subway system. And Ty replies, good, that'll slow him down for sure. Eh, you know, it's okay. It's an okay joke. But in the first script, I had a joke that I really thought was funny. Uh, Izzy says, uh, He's headed to Yankee Stadium. And Ty says, the Yankees, they don't need him. They need pitching. And I thought that was a great joke. That was Bob. And, you know, when either Bob or I had the right joke, we just said it out loud, you know, when we pitched it to each other. We both kind of knew that was the line, you know, uh, whenever it happened. But that was a first choice that they didn't like. So maybe they were worried they're going to get sued by the Yankees. Anyway, we also had a uh, ton of fun with the uh, new storyline we added to the movie that was not in the original movie. For Ty's mom, played by my another old friend, Dorothy Fawn. Daddy. And Bob and I, we work backwards a lot. Uh, so I, I think a lot of writers do this. We saw the punchline we wanted, and then we went back to set it up. So the punchline was Izzy running to the bathroom with stomach issues. And then we saw uh, he kept ingesting things given to him by Ty's mom. And we, we made her into not just a bad cook, but a person with no clue of what's even edible. Uh, and Ty, having grown up with her, uh, he knows that you don't eat a single thing she offers you. But Izzy, he's clueless. How could someone be such a genius in one aspect of life and so clueless in nutrition? Hmm. So, when he starts downing some disgusting concoction, Ty says, Izzy, you're the bravest kid I've ever known. <laughs> I love that stuff. So, I love that all that stuff that leads up to him throwing up. <laughs> it's, it's base, but, you know, it's pretty funny. Coming soon! Digimon, the movie! The Blog, Part 7, Oldies But Goodies. What about NFL films? And that was 20 years ago, okay? Everyone I know there is gone. Or dead. And just go back to anime. You're a superstar in that world. Actor, writer, director. Jeff Nimoy. Mm, it's complicated. I'm with GeekCon. We were wondering if you'd like to be a VIP guest again. I don't really do anime conventions anymore. How does $3,000 sound? Wolfwood is definitely my favorite character of all time. When he died, I cried like a little baby. I cried too. When he died, I was out of a job. Is this pretty much the way you remember it? <sniffs> Smells the same. Jeff Nimoy! I'm your biggest fan. Oh, <laughs> you're right. Oh, she's being serious. How can you stay depressed around me? I guess I can't. Ooh. I can't believe you won an Emmy in 1996. I wasn't even born yet. What? If I dressed like a priest and carried around a giant cross, it would kill my dead Jewish grandmother. At this convention, I'm famous and sexy. Back in LA, I'm George Costanza. Oh. I think I might be falling in love with him. DG Armor Energize! Okay. You're my favorite. Arnold Schwarzenegger as a short order cook. That's right. Put down the short ribs. What are you doing? <laughs> That's not barbecue sauce. It's blood. Here's to adventures in anime. Yeah. Yeah.